All right, well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and um, to this very, uh, and uh, that you'll be able to enjoy some pizza and get out of this blistering cold weather. So uh, I'd like to welcome you to our first event of this uh, semester, and we're very excited to have Professor Eugene Kontrovich from Northwestern Law School here. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Israel's borders and settlements in international law. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have Professor Waters provide commentary, but unfortunately, right at the last minute, he got sick. And so uh, we're uh, unable to have his commentary, and um, we just certainly hope that he gets better because this is the time of year when that happens. So uh, we'll just have Professor Kondrovich, and he'll be speaking, and then uh, when he concludes, we'll have a time for questions. Um, I will make sure that uh, we have an opportunity for everyone to leave uh, before 1 o'clock, and uh, so we'll conclude about, about 5 to 1. And so with that, I would like to have Professor Kondrovich. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, and let me say uh, some words to introduce the scope and methodology of the topic and a few other preliminary matters. Most importantly, uh, hold off your devastating questions till the end. Uh, I'll uh, attend to them then. But if, on the other hand, in, during the talk, you feel like getting more pizza, that absolutely don't hesitate to uh, interrupt, walk right up, because we know what comes first in the Federalist Society, and uh, it's, it's pizza. And also, I'll sound better if you have uh, pizza in your stomach. Uh, so, international law is routinely invoked in a variety of aspects of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we're going to address some of these issues, in particular, the macro issues of, is Israel's presence in the territories called the occupied territories, is it illegal? Is it an occupation of foreign territory? And relatedly, is a, a Jewish civilian presence, is it illegal, illegal in these territories? Is it illegal for Jews to live uh, in these territories? Now, inevitably, the, the standard position, I need not restate, whenever Israel's presence in the West Bank is mentioned, it is with the preface, Israel's illegal occupation. And whenever Jews living or building houses in these territories is mentioned, it's Israeli settlements, which everyone agrees is illegal. So I think that's the, that's the that's standardly reported position. Rarely do new media accounts say why it's illegal. Illegal under what law? What are the sources? So today, we're going to try to look under the hood. And what are the actual sources that supposedly bear on this? What are the sources of international law? OK, next premise. What is international law? Our method is strictly international law today. We are not going to look into who was there first, who God likes, what's nice, who's good, who's good for America. Um, none of that is of interest to us. We're going to look at what international law says. I'm a positivist, so I have no reason to believe what international law says. It would only be coincidentally in accord with what God wants or what's right or proper by any other ethical standard. We're looking at international law. What is international law? Two major sources. Two major sources of international law. Basically, the basic rule, the meta rule, is countries, which are sovereign, can only be bound with their assent. And they can give this assent basically in two ways, explicitly in a treaty. So a treaty creates rules which bind countries because they've agreed to them. Or through custom. Custom is a little more subtle, but when there's a practice of countries done repeatedly by everyone with a sense that it's obligatory, then you can have a binding rule. Custom is harder and indeed these days we have more treaties because the negotiation costs of getting together and making them are lower. Okay. Relatedly, rela nations can delegate decision making, can delegate authority to some other body, like the World Trade Organization or the Security Council. The reason the Security Council has whatever powers it has is because there's a treaty called the United Nations Charter in which nations give the Security Council, delegate to them certain, uh, certain powers. Okay. Why? So that, that's what, where we're going to look for authoritative sources of international law. What is left? What am I? What's left out of authoritative sources of international law? So this is important to know. I could stand up here, and if I was someone else, I would stand up here, and for an hour rattle off 
UN resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, Human Rights Council resolutions, saying that Israel's presence in all of these territories is bad, illegal, and, and very bad. Now, those resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, do not have any legal force. Why don't they have legal force? Is it because we don't like what they say? No, they don't have legal force because the General Assembly is not given any judicial or legislative powers by the UN Charter. It's just a talking shop. Right? That's not, a, uh, that's not a, trying to negatively characterize it. That's what it's supposed to be. Under the, the instrument that creates it, the, General, uh, the UN Charter, it's just a place to get together and swap views. Now, so it reflects the political sentiments of the member nations, which clearly are negative, but it is not a source of lawmaking by the very instrument that creates it. Similar, to say nothing of subordinate bodies of the General Assembly like the Human Rights Council. Also, one could say, and you will often hear invoked in this context, the 2005 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice about Israel's separation fence. Why is that not a binding source? It's the International Court of Justice. Well, the name gives it away. It's an advisory opinion. And under the rules of the International Court of Justice, it can only make binding decisions when countries submit to its jurisdiction, uh, which Israel, uh, is Israel did not. Uh, by the way, it's interesting to know who are they providing advice to. So th this, uh, the opinion does quite strongly say that Israel's presence in these territories is entirely bad and illegal in every which way. It provides not much and very little or none in the way of analysis for this proposition. But uh, who are they providing advice to? The General Assembly, our friend the General Assembly. So the General Assembly asked the other agency of the UN for advice on the following question. Now, you guys who are learning to be appellate lawyers, you're being probably taught that how you frame the question is very important to getting your answer. So this was the question submitted to the ICJ, which the ICJ, very controversially, agreed to, uh, agreed to answer. Bearing in mind that Israel can, maintains, continues to maintain, its illegal occupation of the occupied Palestinian territories, with all of its detrimental implications and consequences, what then are the legal consequences arising from Israel's construction of the illegal wall. So once they took that, you can see why they actually didn't need any analysis for the answer, because the, the answer is contained in, uh, contained in the question. So what is the v value of an ICJ advisory opinion? Persuasive. That is to say, it's the value is as strong as its reasoning, which there wasn't much of. But as a precedential matter, it might have been the, it might as well have been, I would prefer it to have been, the Supreme Court of South Dakota for its value of in a, in, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a source of international law. Okay. So we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to start with basic, looking for authoritative sources of international uh, law. Now, I promised you that I would not talk about who was where first. However, what's cool about this is we can cover about 400 years in 40 seconds, which is useful because we're going to spend half an hour or the rest of the hour on the next, uh, on, the, on, on the following century. So, until nine, from as far back as anyone could possibly care, to 1917, it is very clear where all of these areas, so this is Israel, this is Lebanon here, this is Israel, uh, Syria, all of this area, and all the area around this area, and all the area around that area, was under the sovereignty of the Ottoman-based Turkish Empire. They owned it. There was no dispute about it. Was it fair? Was it nice? Did God want it? Not a question for international law. If you ask anyone in the world in 1917, who does Palestine, which is not what anyone would have called it, who does it belong to? Who does this area? The Levant, as it probably would have been called. Who does it belong to? They would have said the Ottoman Turks. Now, what happens to the Ottoman Turks in 1917? Well, they, can't, they just cease to exist as a political entity. They're on the losing side of World War I, and the Ottoman Empire collapses, and the territories they formerly governed are now left ungoverned, except that they're now occupied by the victorious powers, Britain and France. So what to do with these territories becomes a question. The League of Nations is created after World War I. How is it created? By a treaty. So it's given powers by a treaty. Which countries join this treaty? Basically all of them. All the European ones, African ones, Asian ones, 
Turkey, join the League of Nations, and they delegate to the League of Nations certain powers. One of the powers of the League of Nations under Article 20 is to provide for a kind of fair international solution what to do with the territories that were formerly governed by these vast empires. There were also German imperial territories in Africa. This was not just about the Turks. And they came up with a system called the Mandate System. What's the Mandate System? Today we'd call it nation building. It's what the UN is doing in Bosnia today. They said, these countries should become independent countries. These territories should be divided into independent nation states. No, uh, independent nation states. They're not necessarily ready for that right now. So we're going to give them a little crash course in democracy and institution building, like we did in Iraq for 10 years, or in Bosnia for even longer now. And then we'll leave and they'll be in independent states. This was not just something about the Middle East or Eastern peoples. The same thing was done with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which also collapsed. Every country you know today in Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Czechia and Slovakia, uh, these were all parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the, uh, the, the answer was we're going to create nation-states. There it could happen quicker because the uh, subsidiary components of the Austro-Hungarian Empire actually already had a pre-existing uh, system of parliamentary democracy. Okay, so they create the system of mandate. A mandate is basically uh, saying you're going to oversee the transition of this country to independence. And most of you, if, you, if anyone has ever heard of any, of the, any part of the League of Nations mandate system, if anyone has ever heard of it, you've only heard of the so-called British Mandate for Palestine. The, pa the Mandate for Palestine. Because that's the only one anyone, anyone ever talks about. It was actually the least controversial at the various international conferences to creating this. And it's important to note it was only one of many, I think 16, 20, one of 20-something, a whole international system of mandates, including in the Middle East. So it's not like the League of Nations decided to do a special favor for the Jews. This was a big system. And what, so this is, now what was the League of Nations? So this is the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, more or less. It involves the area we now call Israel, West Bank, Gaza, parts of the Golan Heights, and this other thing, which we'll talk about what that is, this thing next to Israel. Now you'll note, Syria was not Syria. Syria was the French mandate for Syria. And out of that came Syria and Lebanon. Iraq was the British mandate for Mesopotamia. So Iraq was also. All of the, all of the former Ottoman holdings were put under mandatory authority and transitioned to nationhood. This is what the League of Nations said about this mandate, the mandate for Palestine. I don't like to call it the British mandate because, again, there's another British mandate here, the mandate for Mesopotamia. The League of Nations, all the countries in the world, not particularly, no special philo-Semitic sentiment, come and they say, Palestine is going to be a national home for the Jewish people. How does the League of Nations get the power to do this? Again, it is delegated, this power, by the League of Nations treaty that creates it, specifically a power what to do with these territories. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to say anything about on this subject. No one would care what they think. A national home for the Jewish people. Why? Because the Jewish people are from there. That's what the League of Nations says. The historical connection of the Jewish people to this area. This is going to be a Jewish state. And settlement, you know how settlement's a bad word? The settlement's are bad? The only time settlement actually appears as an actual word in an international document is Article 6 of the League of Nations mandate, which promotes the settlement of Jews in Palestine. It says they have a right. The Turks, the Turks did not like Jews moving to this area, and they tried to keep them out. So the League of Nations says, now they can come. And that's supposed to happen in this entire big territory here. Now, very quickly, it, beca it became clear that this territory was probably too big for the number of Jews available. And also, there was a provision in Article 25 that said, in the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, Article 25, that said, if you need to maybe also create an Arab country, you can do it. You can split the mandate in half on the Jordan River and create a new country on the eastern side of the Jordan River can suspend the application. So it contained a partition provision. So if this is not practical to have a Jewish nation, this whole thing, split it, other thing. Now, Britain immediately exercises this option, puts their friends, the Hashemites, 
who um, had unsuccessfully tried to rule Iraq and other places in charge of Jordan, and that's how you get Jordan. But that's how you get the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which had never existed on any map before. So if anyone, if there's ever a conference or a discussion, does Jordan have a right to exist? There probably will not be such a discussion. But if there were ever such a discussion like this about Israel, is Israel, what's Israel's right to exist? Well, if Jordan, if someone came to Jordan, why do you have a right to exist? They'd say, they wouldn't just say League of Nations mandate for Palestine. They'd say League of Nations mandate for Palestine, Article 25. That's the sort, that's Jordan's right to exist with those particular borders. Okay. So, what do, so what's left for the, so what is left here is this entire area, which in, clearly entails, there's no West Bank here, there's no division of a West Bank. The entire area from the river, from the Jordan River to the sea, is left to, as this entity, Palestine, designated as a national home. That is a pretty good international law basis. Right? If you ask France, why does France get to be a national home for the French people, they don't even have a League of Nations mandate. Right? If you ask Japan, why is Japan a national home for the Japanese? Just because. They don't even have a mandate. So this is pretty good. This is a recent, strong pedigree. And whatever you think of a national home for the Jewish people, it's quite clear that these were the borders. There was no little carve-out for Gaza. There was, no, there was no such thing. These are the borders, as of 1920-something. That's pretty good. Now, because it's pretty clear that this is pretty good, people who don't like the idea of Israel having this territory have to argue against the validity of the mandate itself. Now, how does that work? So you have to say something, I think, like, um, mandate shmandate. Whoever heard of the League of Nations? Whoever heard of Class A mandates? Why should we care? Why should we be bound by how some dead white men, though there were also not white men amongst them, uh, but let's say, proverbial dead white men, carved up this area a hundred years ago. Whoever heard from these people? Whoever knew from these people? What's it to us? It sounds, you know... Britain and France, it sounds colonial. No, it wasn't, of course, because were, they were creating sovereign countries, not imperial possessions. But why should we care? It's illegitimate slash irrelevant. Something like that. You have to attack the validity of the mandate. Now, what's the problem? Other than opponents of Israel's claim to this land, I'll name you, there are only two other people who have ever attacked mandates. Uh, one of them was Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, when he invaded Kuwait, he didn't just invade without a reason. There was a time, historically, when Kuwait was a province of Iraq. It was not included in the mandate for Mesopotamia. He thought it should have been. Right? It was not included in the border. He said, why should I care about the borders? Those are artificial borders. Mandate, mandate. Nobody in the world agreed with Saddam's interpretation. Everyone says, no, the mandate borders, those are the borders we've got. Uh, our current friend and peace partner, uh, Assad, on his map, there's no Lebanon. Because Lebanon, right, and Syria invaded Lebanon in the 80s and occupied it for a long time. Because Lebanon was spun off from Syria to create a Christian Arab country alongside a Muslim one, just like Jordan was spun off by the British from Palestine to create a Muslim country alongside a Jewish one. That was done, done by France as a mandatory power. Assad says, why should I care what they did under the mandate? Mandate, shmandate. No one agrees with that argument. Because here's the thing. If the mandates are invalid, your problem is far beyond the borders of Israel, right? whether there's a little thingy here and a little thingy there, a West Bank and a Gaza. If the mandates are invalid, it calls into question all of the borders of the Middle East. Because they're all mandatory borders. Mandatory borders is all we got. You call into question the borders of Turkey, the existence of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, um, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the whole thing. The very existence of Jordan. But if the mandate was invalid, shouldn't Jordan go poof? So... You, Nobody really doubts the existence of the mandate, the validity of the mandates. They just don't like this particular mandate. And that's already a bit of, uh, a bit of special pleading. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the mandate. And this is, this is what the borders look like and are presumed to be the presumptive borders until, until it becomes clear after World War II. Why did they pick... Uh, Britain and France to uh, administer these mandates. 
It's not because they were colonial powers, it's because there are powers. Administering a mandate takes power. You have to control things in an area far away. After World War II, Britain was not happy about controlling anything. They were broke, and they said, we're done. We're out of the mandate business. And what the mandate, you have to think of, it's like a trust, right? And the mandatory is a trustee. Ah, I forgot to say. If you think the mandates are also irrelevant or a product of an earlier era, they were actually legitimized and continued by the UN. So when the League of Nations went out of business, the UN specifically took over the mandates. They renamed them trusteeships. And America itself was a trustee of several former mandatory territories in the uh, Pacific uh, well, into, uh, well, well, in, well into the 90s. And that's what a mandate is. It's a trust. So Britain's the trustee. And it says, usually, here's a hard, a hard question. Usually the question in trust law is there's a trustee and he has keys to the money in the bank. And most of trust law is about making sure the trustee doesn't steal the money from the bank right, before the person grows up. What if it's not money in the bank? What if it's radioactive waste? What, trustee, what trust law has no good answer to, or international law, is what happens when the trustee says, I am getting so far away from this money in the bank, I'm throwing away the key, I'm running away, I'm not even going to tell you where the key is, I'm out of here. That's what Britain did. Because it became clear that when Israel became independent, when the Jewish state became independent, there would be war with the local Arabs, and Britain was going to be in between. And already there was war and fighting between the Arabs and the Jews all throughout the 30s. Britain was caught in the middle. Afterwards, they said, we are out of here. What about the mandate? Figure it out yourselves, was exactly, was exactly the answer. So it was clear that there was going to be a big war here. And so the newly created United Nations, create, came, they, they sent experts and fact finders. And they came up with a peace plan, an international peace plan. Right? We have one of these now in Geneva. So it's like they sent all these experts. That we're going we're gonna to figure out a way. And it was like uh, Cosby, Stills, and Nash. We can share the land. We can all live together. That's what they said. They said, you don't have to fight. Even though we split Palestine already once, right? let's just split it again. And now, and this is the split they famously proposed. The famous, when, it, when you talk about, when pe people will often say the General Assembly voted to have a Jewish state. They didn't vote to have it. The League of Nations already decided to do this. They voted to reduce to propose a reduction in the size of this state. And they came up with this very funny map in which they divide the area into six sectors, each of which touch, well, not at all, uh, and the Arabs get the red part and the Jews get the blue part. Um, note that Yaffa, which is today the southern section of Tel Aviv, is an extraterritorial area under Arab sovereignty. And Jerusalem was going to be a international city, patrolled by these kind of uh, international police. They never arrived because they heard they were shooting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically there had been at the time a series of absolutely disastrous international city projects like Danzig and Trieste, and they thought they'd try it again. Uh, so this was the idea. Jerusalem would be a uh, greater Jerusalem, including Bethlehem and some surrounding areas, would be uh, an international city. This was the proposal. What is the legal status of this proposal? The General Assembly voted to approve it. Yeah. There's no legal binding. Because it's the General Assembly. The General Assembly can maybe, maybe declare, you know, next Wednesday to be International Day of Sport. But they cannot make any binding legal decisions, let alone, let alone alter the borders of countries, let alone change the consequences of League of Nations mandates, which under Article 80 sub 1 of the UN Charter are specifically protected from UN action. So why did they even propose it? What did they think they were doing? They were making a solution. They were proposing an arbitral solution. That's most of what international law is, arbitration and mediation between countries. If both sides had accepted this deal, it would be binding. So then we're the UN. We're fair. Here's what we think should be done. If both sides had accepted it, this would be the map. As it happens, the Jewish side did accept it, the Arab side said no, and then it has the status of any rejected arbitral offer, nothing. However, the fact that this was seen as fair does shed light on today. You often hear that you know, it's important to have a continuous Palestinian state. Apparently, the UN did not think contiguity was, this is a, almost a maximally discontiguous border. So this does not change anything. 
We're still with the League of Nations mandate, right? They said, guys, don't fight. We have a way for you not to fight. Agree to this. There was not an agreement, and it wound up that they did fight. And this was Israel's War of Independence, um, also called the Nakba, or the disaster by, uh, by the Arabs. Oh, by the way, so you know how to, today, in Washington, everyone has a peace plan. Right? Every think tank has a peace plan, different ways of creating areas in where Jews won't be able to live. This is not a new thing. Back in the 1930s and early 40s, everyone had a partition proposal, as they were then called, different ways to cut it up. Most of the partition proposals were very aggressive. This is a, this is a, a, a British one. So anyway, so this was the, there were everyone, there was many others. Everyone, everyone had a partition proposal in their pocket, but none of them were agreed. And the, in the end, the matter was decided the way these things often are, through arms. And what happens, Israel declares independence and is immediately invaded by all of the surrounding countries armies from all the surrounding countries, plus some of the sur countries that surround the surrounding countries, sent some people also. Um, and, for the, and for the first time, this is what we call Gaza in the West Bank, emerge as entities as a result of the War of Independence, and it's important to understand how they emerge. Jordan, joined by Iraq, comes in here, and Egypt comes up with an armored column up here. And they're planning to meet in the middle. What is their goal? To, you know, to, to capture this territory so that it cannot be a Jewish state. What you see here is simply how far their armies successfully got. This had nothing to do with any kind of division. So the Egyptian armored column gets most of the way to Tel Aviv. They get pushed back here. This is the Gaza Strip. There's nothing strippy about the Gaza Strip. There's nothing. It's not a, what do you call it, pre-demarcated area. It's where the Egyptians got pushed back to. The reason, do you see how there's this little pocket here? That's because the Jordanian army came up here, and then there was a big push to, for, by the Israelis to take Jerusalem. That push was only half successful, and they took half of Jerusalem. And that, this is a, a salient. Right? This is just a bulge of an army unit that broke in. Then, at the end, they fought to a stalemate. They fought to a stalemate. And they signed an armistice agreement. What is an armistice agreement? It is not a peace treaty. It is a deal to stop shooting for a bit. Right? In World War I, they had armistices every other day. Right? It's not a peace treaty. What's the armistice? Okay, and remember, this, the, the genesis, <coughs> these things, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, they do not reflect any pre-existing political, administrative, territorial, demographic, topographic, or ethno-linguistic borders. This is the first time they pop up on the map. So let's see. The, and they're created by an armistice agreement between Israel and Jordan. So this part's occupied. First of all, they're occupied by two totally different countries. Jordan is, occupies the West Bank. Egypt occupies Gaza. And this is what the instrument, so the green line. You've heard of things across the green line. Jewish settlements across the Green Line. What makes it green? The Israeli colonel who drew this line, all these lines were, were they, met, they had a meeting in Cyprus, the Israelis and the Jordanians, and they drew a line, each, each officer, where their respective forces were, so they would know where not to shoot at each other. The Israeli colonel had a green marker. Um, and what's this line say? The armistice demarcation line is not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary. Period. It's not a border. If you think that this green line has any validity, the very instrument that creates it, imagine just a big asterisk over it. Not a border, not a border, not a border. The line comes with not a border. You can't say, as a matter of fact, this is the only, the reason it's article, this is the only thing the Israelis and the, Israelis and the Arabs could agree on. That it's not a border. Because Israel said, we, reserve, we want the rest of it. And the Arabs said, yes, us too, in the opposite direction. So that's, that's why it's not a border. So it's very hard to say. So what was our previous default? The League of Nations mandate borders. What's our current situation? It's been modified. There's this armistice agreement, but it's hard to imagine that it can modify the League of Nations borders because the first thing it says is, we're not modifying borders. More importantly, what is the important? We see that the very entity, the existence of the West Bank and Gaza, are purely a product 
of what was generally considered illegal Arab aggression against the newly created state of Israel with a goal of preventing its creation. Regardless, let's assume, regardless of what you think of the, what do you call it, merits of having a Palestinian state. Let's say it's a great idea to have a, a, a new Palestinian state. To assume, as our president has said, that the 1949 armistice agreements are the territorial baseline of those states is to retroactively vindicate, legitimate, and reward in full the Arab conquest attempt of 1949. That is to say, it's true. They wanted to co conquer this territory to prevent it from being a Jewish state. And that they get to win. They, that, that gets to be a valid thing. Because all, all this is, all the green line is, is the furthest extent of Jordanian-Egyptian aggression in 1948 and 19, 1949. Why one would want to give that the imprimatur of law is entirely unclear. We also see that the occupation of these territories began not in 1967, but in 1949. So West Bank was occupied by Jordan from 1949 to 1967. How many General Assembly resolutions? There are now roughly, General Assembly roughly 20 times a year condemns Israel for occupation. Uh, 22 sometimes. Uh, just to give you an idea, it condemns any other country maybe once or twice a year, at most. Um, how many times did it condemn the occupation of the Palestinian territories, so to speak? 1949 to 1967. Zero. Not only that, how many times was it proposed, debated, and failed? Zero. So apparently, it's only, a, it's only a special kind of problem, the occupation of these, uh, of these territories. As they were clearly occupied belligerently by Jordan and Egypt, respectively. So they were, first of all, under two different countries, right? Egypt. Okay, now what happens in 1967? Six-day war, the June War, as the Arabs call it. Uh, I think because there's more days in June than six. Uh, and Israel makes amazing conquests or military gains, in particular the entire Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, Gaza Strip, and the West Bank. Interestingly, the West Bank was kind of a very opportune thing for Israel, because Jordan, which was occupying it, did not enter the war initially. It wanted to stay out of the war. But then the dictators of Egypt and Syria kept like, teasing it, and finally it, uh, it, it entered uh, at, at, at the last moment. But Israel had not originally attacked Jordan, uh, thinking it could stay out of the war. Okay, we see something very interesting here. Of the territories acquired by Israel in 1967, there's a, they have two different legal statuses. Because what could you say about Israel's coming into the possession of uh, West Bank and Gaza 19 years uh, later, in 1967? So you could say, first of all, it, this could be just Israeli sovereign territory. Why is it Israeli sovereign territory? It's part of the League of Nations mandate. Nothing has happened to change those borders. Right? Jordan was occupying it, but no countries recognized any claim of sovereignty by Jordan. So Jordan was just there. Jordan's not there anymore. Israel's the successor state to the League of Nations mandate. Poof. It's Israel's. Now, another version is maybe it's not yet Israel's, because Israel had not yet perfected sovereignty. However, Israel has a superior claim of title to Jordan, who, uh, the, the power being evicted. The reason I can't say, tell you which one it is is because we don't know the answer to what happens when there's a mandated territory whose trustee absconds. Okay, we don't know the answer to that. Um, but Israel clearly has a, a superior claim of title. Now, on the other hand, the Golan Heights. So if anyone asked you and asked in 1966, who's the West Bank belong to? No one would say Jordan, and no one would say Palestine, and no one would say Israel. It's, it's occupied by Jordan, and Israel has this claim. It's one of these disputed Kashmir kind of places. If anyone asked you, any, if anyone asked in 1966, who does the Golan Heights or the Sinai Peninsula belong to, there was the Egypt and Syria, respectively, or Syria and Egypt, respectively. No doubt, no doubt. Mandate was not uh, the Golan Heights was not part of the mandate. E Sinai Peninsula surely was not part of the mandate. So Israel's claim to these territories, Israel's claim to the West Bank and Gaza, it's pretty great. Right? It's, we have this mandate. The mandate had clear borders. We always go by mandate borders. See Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Assad in Le Lebanon. Nothing has happened to change those things, neither the Jordanian aggression uh, nor the uh, UN uh, proposal. On the other hand, there's 
You can't do that with Go on Heights and uh, Sinai Peninsula. It, it is admittedly a weaker Wego coin. What would the, what is the Wego coin? Uh, it's weaker, but I think still pretty good at it. The Wego coin is defensive conquest. Now, the basic rule of international law is you cannot get territory through conquest anymore. That's not written down anywhere. It's an inference. What's an inference from? The UN Charter banning aggression. So if aggression is illegal, right, if you make robbery illegal, then presumably you can't keep what you steal. So it's an inference. Everyone with me? But does the UN Charter make all uses of force illegal? Self-defense, it says, is inherently legal. So if the use of force is legal, our inference falls apart. Our inference falls apart. And it's not clear, right? It's, not, it's no longer an ill-gotten gain, gains situation. Now, most international law scholars say, oh, well, it's quite clear that it also applies to defensive conquest. I don't know when it became clear. I can tell you in 1967, nobody thought it was clear. Um, I mean, the day after this war, it became very clear. But when you look at what academics were writing in 1966, as a matter of fact, most people thought it was, if not not clear, but rather that defensive conquest would be okay, because if the use of force is legal, then, um, then uh, why not? Okay, but in any case, it's interesting that there, so you, it's important to note this difference. Now, for the West Bank and Gaza, Israel has both things going, defensive conquest and use of force. Okay. Now, the UN Security Council responds to this situation with the famous Resolution 242, which becomes the foundation document for uh, all subsequent international approaches to this issue. It's important to say, what is the Security Council's power to deal with this issue? But the Security Council is not like um, international law god. They can't just make up any rules. But there's interesting questions in international law. Can the Security Council violate international law? Basic answer is no. Uh, they do have powers to recommend or order, to order actions to respond to threats to international peace. How far those powers go is interesting. But this is the Chapter 7 power to you know, authorize military force and whatnot. So here's what they say. Famous thing. It calls for a withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. Well, finally, we've come to an end, and I promised you 20 minutes of uh, questions. It, said, it says Israel has to withdraw. What's the question? Okay. Now, what if I told you, but it doesn't say Israel has to withdraw from all the territories. Well, that sounds a little bit like a lawyerly kind of special pleading argument. Unless, unless, you know the legislative history. In international law, legislative history is a, is, a, is a recognized, legitimate tool, required tool of interpretation. They even call it travaux prepatoire, which makes it sound smarter. Um, legislative history is just some backroom deals, right? Boviating senators. But travaux prepatoire, they really thought about it. Uh, so it's important to know everyone who voted on this resolution knew this was not the first proposed text. The first proposed text by the pro Soviet pro-Arab countries at the Security Council, specifically said withdrawal of all Israeli armed, of, of Israeli armed forces from all the territories. And they went through a series of drafts that said all the, all the territories or just the territories. And each time Britain and America, but in particular Britain, said, no, we're going to veto that. Because we think it's unreasonable. Why should Israel have to withdraw from the old city of Jerusalem? from the Temple Mount, from the mountain range in the West Bank that controls the coastal towns from which they were getting sniped. They said, it's not reasonable, and it's not realistic, they said. They said they're not going to do it, and this is just going to join what was then the very short, and now it was the much longer list, of Security Council resolutions that get ignored. So they said, you have to make it realistic. So they have to withdraw from some territory, but not all the territory, otherwise we'll veto it. Now, why was that such a threat? Because this whole thing was a U.S.-Soviet proxy standoff, and it was considered very important to put some kind of diplomatic lid on it, so that it did not spiral out of control. So you didn't just want to veto in a collapse of this thing. So finally, they came up with this, the British proposed this language, from territories, which would mean not all the territories. Now, the Arabs were very opposed to this. They said, no, we want all the territories. As soon as this resolution was voted on, was accepted, the Arab states and the Soviets said, look, it says withdraw from territories. That naturally means 
all the territories, which then raises the question why they opposed this language like two hours before. Um, in particular, when you read the resolution as a whole, it clearly suggests that it does not mean all the territories. Now, people often point to the preamble, emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. They say, ah, oh, clearly that means it's all the territories. Right? That's what it means. But you, you, that turns right around. Right? Because if we're, so it, if we're recognizing the admissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, and Israel's supposed to leave, no one's talking about creating a Palestinian state there. Right? Israel would leave, and presumably Egypt and Jordan would come back. So if Israel can't keep this territory, doesn't that, re uh, what do you call it, wouldn't that admit the permissibility of the acquisition of territory by war? by Jordan and Egypt. So if it's inadmissible to acquire territory in war, it's very hard to see why this territory should go back to Jordan, which acquired it in a very recent war, Egypt as well. More importantly, since it was part of the League of Nations mandate, at least with respect to um, Gaza and the West Bank, not with respect to the Golan Heights and, and uh, Sinai, Israel's not acquiring it. It already has it. It's just kicking out. All right, so it, it, if you, if, you were, if you kick out a, what do you call it, would be a trespasser, or would be adverse possessor, are you acquiring your land? No, just re removing uh, interference to your beneficial enjoyment. But anyway, that's a preamble. I don't like reading things in the light of preambles, because I think that's why things are put in preambles. Um, <laughs> but take a look at the next, nobody talks about the next operative clause. Yeah. This is required. This is operative stuff. This is stuff that is just as binding as Clause 1. So you have to read them in conjunction. Clause 2 says, so this is what the Arabs have to do. Termination of all states of belligerency. All the Arab states have still been in a formal state of war with Israel. Uh, and an acknowledgment of the sovereignty of Israel, that is to say, of every state in the area and their right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries. That's a substantive modification. It doesn't say... Within 1967, or what President Obama likes to call the 1949 armistice lines, many people do. The ninth, if you ever hear people talk about Israel's 1967 borders, they mean the 1949 armistice lines. So it's a misnomer in two ways. First of all, it's not, 19, it's not from 1967. The 1967 borders are this. It's the 1949 borders. And they're not borders. Because as we see, the first thing they say is they're not borders. Other than that, the characterization of the green line is... 1967 borders is very accurate with, with those two modifications. Um, not borders and not 1967. So secure and right. So they don't say 1949 borders. They don't say, pre, uh, what do you call it? Um, as many UN Security Council uh, resolutions say, the situation that obtained on some prior date or the, uh, 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 the, the antebellum situation. Secure and recognized is a substance. Did anyone recognize the 1949 borders? No. First of all, because they were called not borders, and also because no one recognized any borders of Israel. So that would be a very weird way to recognize, would not be a description of those borders, nor would secure. This was what Abba Eben, uh, the liberal uh, Israeli statesman, the famous one, called Auschwitz borders, and that was a generally agreed upon characterization from a security perspective. Eight miles wide, right, probably the town of Bloomington, is not a secure border. What makes it substantive? Nothing in international law says that a state has any kind of inherent right to secure borders. That is to say, some countries are Canada, good for them. Some countries are Poland, bad for them. This is saying, here, we want secure borders to come out, because we want the solution not to put us back in the same situation that caused the war in the first place. So clearly, Israel only has to withdraw from some territories, which, by the way, has Israel fulfilled this obligation? Israel has withdrawn from close to 99% of the territories, including 100% of the Sinai Peninsula, which at the time contained Israel's only known petrochemical reserves, the Gaza Strip, small parts of the Golan Heights, and about a third of the West Bank, clearly fulfilling this obligation both in spirit and in letter. So what was the idea of the UN Security Council? What, what did they think? What should be the territories Israel withdraws to? And I'll end on this. Well, they said, maybe they'd make a deal. If they want peace, if they want the secure and recognized boundaries, peace with their neighbors, then they should make a deal with their neighbors. What would be the parameters of their deal would be up to the deal, not up to the international law. 
So again, whatever one thinks of the creation of a Palestinian state, it, its creation and its borders is not a man act of international mandate, but rather a purely diplomatic issue, uh, which is within the complete negotiation discretion of, of, of the parties. And Israel, Israel has a clear sovereign claim to the entire territory of the West Bank, which, by the way, would mean the settlements there aren't even settlements because you can't settle, as an international law perspective, your own territory. Uh, there's much more to say about settlements. I'm, I want to get your questions. I'm sorry I took so long. I thought I was very compelling as well. <laughs> <laughs> but please, some. Yeah. Do you have a law review article, or could you make this presentation available for us? I'm really enjoying it. I'd like to look over there. Thank you. I have, um, send me an email at my, and I will send you a link to a video of it. I'm, I wonder, I, I've been meaning to write a book, but then, you know, articles keep in the way of getting in the way of writing books. It's, I need to write a book about it. Uh, the, much of this is kind of, has been argued in different other ways. There are more subtle arguments. So an ar article I'm writing now, no one, no one has done any research on any of this because people seem to be quite content with the much repeated standard interpretation. Uh, so here's a question. If you wanted to say all the territories and you were the UN Security Council, would this be the natural way to say it or not? How would one approach thinking about that question as a lawyer? What would you do? Where would you look? It's easy. So if, when the Security Council wants to say, withdraw from all territories, how does it put it? Where would you look? Other resolutions. Other resolutions! You don't need to be. Nobody has done this. So you often also hear that all international lawyers agree X or Y about Israel. That it's true, but the agreement is very thin. That is to say, it's not based on actually having looked into anything. Yes, other resolutions. So I, I'm just finishing something where I looked at both... This is not the only time someone has, you know, marched into someone else's territory or their own territory. There were about six such resolutions calling for territorial withdrawal by armies before, and like a lot since. And they all say either all the territories or say withdraw to, and what do you call it, specify the date of the borders, the, the, the armistice lines that existed as of so-and-so date. It's the only way the UN does this. You would think with so much invested in making sure that territories means all the territories, I would have expected, I wasn't surprised by the pre-67 practice, that makes sense, but you would have thought the post-67, since all these other things are like Uganda and things no one cares about, that they would, they would, they would have actually specifically in those things said all, just said territories, when they meant all the territories, to show that territories means all the territories, but they couldn't say that because they still wanted to accomplish what they were trying to accomplish, uh, and uh, it turns out that this is a unique usage in Security Council practice. Yeah? I guess my question then would be, why didn't they specify exactly which territories they were talking about? Be because, again, because they didn't have any idea. Here, ah, okay, so here's, if they were going to set, what would that mean? That would mean they would have to draw a map of what the new borders would look like right there. Israel and the Palestinians have been negotiating that, path, that specific question for the past 20 years with no success. And they were supposed to do it right there at the UN. Like they were, so what did they do? This is a very diplomatic thing. This was an, why did John Kerry not negotiate the, um, actually what Iran has to do with its nuclear weapons in, uh, in Geneva? Well, they would have disagreed, and it wouldn't have gone anywhere. So better, it was, they agreed to continue discussing. This is the most diplomatic thing. Territories just means TBD. We'll get back to you. Work it out. It, it's not specified. Yeah. Is Israel bound by its decision to withdraw from the territories it did withdraw from, or could it go back into Sinai and say, that's not a settlement? That's okay. So let me, let me distinguish this in two ways. That's a great question. So Israel withdrew from the Sinai under the framework of the Camp David peace agreement with Egypt. It is bound by that treaty. It is bound by that treaty because it is part of a, it is part of a treaty. On the other hand, Israel withdrew from Gaza, not as part of any treaty, but just as a, we are out of here. However, I do think, regrettably in my view, that this could be construed as an act of abandonment in international law and a waiver of their legal claims. 
However, Israel has not waived its legal claims to the West Bank in any way, shape, or form. But that is precisely why I believe uh, the Secretary of State and the President are so insistent on Israel agreeing in principle to the notion of so-called 67 borders as a baseline. Because even though that would not result in a peace deal now or in our lifetimes, it would, at least, it would actually be able to later be used as evidence of an abandonment of the underlying legal land. That's why it's a big thing to agree to. Okay, thank you guys so much. Please feel free to get pizza on your way out. Yeah.